Okay. Uh, very welcome all. So uh, big picture is we are still talking about ways of representing an image. And we started in the first week by looking at what you can do with single pixels, which is only so much. We looked at patches last week. Um, you can already do a few interesting things. And today, I want to talk about how to represent an image in reciprocal space or in the space of a unitary transform. Um, this area of image analysis is mathematically very well understood. So from uh, the 1960s to the 1990s, this, together with pixel-level processing, was essentially all that you had to know. Uh, on the downside, you know, computers were a horror back then, and you could not... Uh, so, so video processing was practically not possible on digital devices simply because you didn't have enough storage. So if you want to do research in this area today, good thing is you have much faster computers or much bigger memory. Bad thing is you need to learn much more. Huh? So, so what I do now, a few years ago, would have covered an entire semester. And at the end of it, you know, you would have been well versed in image analysis. And today, this is just a tiny part of image analysis. So I will start by talking about a discrete one-dimensional signal at first, a signal that has been uniformly sampled. And later today, we will generalize to two and more dimensions. So the title is already there, uh, unitary transforms. For starters, we take a, a one-dimensional signal, which is discrete and which can be complex. And is of length n. Let me also add that it's uniformly sampled. So that simply means the distances between one sample point and the next are the same throughout. OK, I want to derive such unitary transforms. And we start by applying a linear transform or, oper or operator. And the transform I will denote with a squiggle above the letter. Um, in the literature, you usually find other conventions. People either use capital letters for the transform or they put a hat, a circumflex, on the letter. I avoid the hat because it has a different meaning in statistics. And I avoid the capital letters because I want to use them for matrices, such as this one. So we have our signal, which is n by 1. I have a linear transform, which I can represent by a m by n matrix. And then I get an m by 1 output. Now, if m is less than n, then uh, what we do is we project the signal to a lower dimensional space, which uh, exceptions notwithstanding means we are going to lose some information, usually. Uh, if, on the other hand, if m is larger than n, then we project to an overcomplete or to a redundant representation. So let's say we take a signal with five entries. We can project this to a space with seven dimensions but we're going to populate only a subspace in this higher dimensional space. So in this sense, some of the dimensions are superfluous. And 
if on the other hand if a has rank n then the transform is invertible and so we're not going to lose any information and from now on I'm going to focus on the case where m is n so we have a square matrix a now you know the space of all square matrices is uh, that's a very large family to choose from so we're going to look for family members with favorable properties and one favorable property i will argue is to preserve the dot product between signals. So out of all possible, uh, sorry, n by n matrices of full rank, let's consider those that preserve the dot product. or the inner product between two signals. So um, this is, you know, you can either write this as a cross or as a dagger. Dagger is uh, Deutsch in German. Yeah? Um, what this means is that uh, this is the conjugate transpose. So uh, G plus is the same as G transpose and then uh, taking the complex conjugate. It has various names. It's called the conjugate transpose or um, the adjoint matrix if it's a matrix or the Hermitian conjugate. Since you have all done quantum mechanics, you will know this. OK. Um, and now we want the inner product between these two signals to remain the same after the transform. So if I transform G, and if I transform H, I want this equality to hold. And I can rewrite the right-hand side by saying this is G conjugate transpose, here the A adjoint, A and H. And if you now compare the left-hand side with the right-hand side, we see that this will hold the adjoint of A times A is the identity matrix. And the transforms for which uh, this holds, those are exactly the unitary transforms. So in such unitary transforms, we know that um, all rows of this matrix are orthogonal and of norm 1. Now this family of unitary transforms is much, much smaller than the family of square matrices of full rank. But it's still a large family. And uh, let's look at some famous members. So there is the wavelet transform, for example, that we'll talk about next time. I asked at the beginning of 
the semester. I think some of you heard about wavelets already. Yes. Can you say again if you've Okay, one, two, three. Good, good, good. Okay. I'll talk about that more next week. Wavelet transform. Um, then the Hadama, which is known by various names. Rademacher, or if you like long names, is also the Hadama, Rademacher, Walsh transform. Uh, found independently by all of these people. And that has uses, for example, in quantum computing and in data encryption. But also in compression, which is also a main application field of wavelets, compression and denoising of signals. Then there is the discrete cosine transform, which is uh, famously used for JPEG compression. So its main use is compression. And then, and this is what we will talk about today at length, there is the Fourier transform. Which is uh, universally useful. So you will, you know, you know, no matter what field you you go into, uh, you you will see the discrete Fourier transform being being used 